And we are moving to the last speaker of this session, uh, Profer Pro Pro Professor Eckerstein. If uh, Eckerstein, correct? Uh, it's a professor of clinical chemistry in the University Hospital in Zurich. And uh, he will talk to us about the exploitation of uh, uh, HDL, high density lipoprotein, nano, uh, lipoproteins in nanomedicine. So please. Yeah, thank you very much for this nice introduction. Um, I have been asked to talk about the exploitation of high density lipoproteins for nanomedicine. And it, as you will see, HDL or high density lipoproteins are, so to say, natural nanoparticles. Um, that can be exploited for diagnostics and therapy, hopefully. Um, I mean, the H interest in HDL or HDL cholesterol, I must say, is mostly resulting from epidemiological studies that showed that low HDL cholesterol is increasing the risk of coronary heart disease and the opposite of what LDL cholesterol shows, the positive association. And many people describe the HDL cholesterol, so to say, as a good cholesterol. I mean, and if one explains this association in a very simplified manner, which I think is probably not true, but that's how people like to understand the contribution of the lipoproteins is that LDL are delivering the cholesterol to the artery and HDL is able to remove it. And I think what is used in nanomedicine um, or what can be used in nanomedicine are two aspects. On the one hand, it's the exploitation of HDL as a as a drug itself, namely for its protective effects in the vascular wall. And the other point is that HDL, to remove the atherosclerotic, uh, the cholesterol from the macrophages in the atherosclerotic plaque have to enter the vascular wall. So one can take the HDL also as, also as a vehicle, either to bring um, material for imaging into the plaque or to take drugs into the plaque um, that can exert local effects. So if we talk about HDL, um, I like to start with a very simplified version of HDL of high density lipoproteins. The most simple version of an HDL is shown on the left side. It's a discoidal particle that contains only epholipotein A1 or another water soluble epholipotein like EPOE. It contains in a, about 1 to 100 ratios at a hundredfold excess of phosphodylcholine molecules. And then you can have also some unestrified cholesterol on this particle. This particle is only the minority of the HDL particles in our bloodstream. It makes less than 5% of our HDL in the bloodstream, but it's a particle that can be used um, for nanomedicine because you can, as you will see, reconstitute this particle artificially. The HDL that we have in the bloodstream is much more complicated. It's a spheroidal particle that contains, in addition to EPOE1, phospholipids, cholesterol, the core of cholesterol esters and to a minor degree of triglycerides and what makes it even more complicated that this particle carries a lot of other molecules, other proteins, other lipids and with the um, advance of lipidomics and proteomics we know nowadays that about 80 different proteins have been associated with HDL, about 200 lipid species have been associated and most recently even microRNAs have been found to be transported in the bloodstream by high density lipoteins. The important point that I would like to make is that if you calculate the stoichiometry of these constituents, um, then you will see that most of these constituents are um, less abundant than the particle numbers. They are constituents like EPOE1 or phosphodylcholine or cholesterol where you have an excess, that you have more molecules um, than particles. But if you go to other molecules like sphingosine 1-phosphate or microRNAs, then you find frequently less than one per particle, I mean, statistically. But this is important to see what, uh, if you see the biological activities of natural HDL, they are rather wide. And some of these activities are exerted by the natural protein, epolipotin A1, the major protein. But there are other activities like, for example, one beneficial effects on endothelial cells, stimulation of nitric oxide production, uh, stimulation of migration of endothelial cells, inhibition of cell adhesion that are mediated by this minor lipid sphingosine 1-phosphate or there are other enzymes carried that are mediate the antioxidant effects. Um, nevertheless, these um, very simple discoidal particles that can be made in vitro, that can be also made by industrial processes, turned out to be very effective in at least animal models to uh, interfere with disease and also to be exploited for drug delivery and for imaging. 
Um, these proteins, these particles consist, usually you prepare them with apolagotin A1, with a wild type apoA1. Some um, also use um, mutants, naturally mutants of apoA1, like the apoA1 Milano, or there can be derivatives of apoA1. You can dimerize or trimerize apoA1 molecules with, um, with helper molecules. One, there are also particles where ApoE instead of ApoE1 is used or where amphipathic peptides that are synthesized are used. Then of course there is variability in composition in the phospholipid and then you can add additional lipids like for example sphingomyelin and what is most important for nanomedicine, you can add additives, additives to, to improve the targeting of the particle additives for labeling that can be exploited for, and also nanocrystals that can be exploited for imaging. You can add drugs, and even if you go for siRNAs or um, antisense oligonucleotides, they can also be incorporated into these artificial HDL particles. Um, there are different possibilities to produce them. Um, we, in the research lab, we mostly use this method which is called collate dialysis method. That means you start with a mixture of apolipotein or phospholipids and with bile acids and then you dialyze the bile acids out of the mixture and what you are left with are these reconstituted particles. But this is of course a process that is um, probably not ideal for, for large scale production. There are very interesting developments where also microfluidics is used to prepare these RHDL particles. So where have been these HDL particles been used? There are some applications that are already in the clinical phase, but most of the work that has been done has been done in animals. In principle, I would say there are three fields that these reconstituted HDL particles are applied. One field is therapy, another one is imaging, and a third one is drug delivery. Um, most of the work has been done for direct therapeutic exploitation of the HDL particles. There have been two, at least two, or three clinical phase two trials where HDL particles have been used. Um, there are clinical one phase studies where um, HDL, artificial HDL have been shown to improve glycemia and to improve the response to lipopolysaccharide. And then there are different studies where um, Regression of atherosclerosis was induced in animals where inhibition of virus infections, but also parasite infections like trypanosoma or bacterial infection have been reduced with this HDL. And there is some recent work there, apoe containing RHDL have been used to improve um, some phenotypes of Alzheimer mouse models. Um, imaging, there is also a lot of work which mostly has been done in animals, in rabbits and mice. Um, for MRI, guanidine, uh, gadolinium has been used, or also ferrum oxide. And there are other imaging um, devices like quantum dots, where also HDL has been used for delivery. And if it comes to drug delivery, statins and in a cancer model, doxorubicin has been used. I don't want to go through all these examples, but only show one example for each indication. One is the use of RHDL to induce regression of atherosclerosis in an acute coronary syndrome session uh, setting. These were patients that had an acute coronary syndrome who underwent intravascular ultrasound. They were treated with um, placebo or with this RHDL, which contain a mutant APOA1. And what has been found in principle that there was a regression um, when these RHDL have been applied. However, there was not a clear dose response, so we have to wait for next studies. It took a while. You see this has been published already in 2003, so more than 12 years, and everybody wonders why it doesn't go ahead. One reason is that this drug has been delivered from one company to another one, so it's continued by the medicines company now. A parallel study has been published four years later with um, CSL bearing um, FOA1 RHDL, and also they got similar results, but there were some toxicity problems, so that this has to be refined, and now the refined version, which is called CSL112, is also under further development. And then there is a French company, Serenis, that develops another reconstituted HDL particle. This has been applied in 
FFH patients and in hypoalpha lipidinemia patients, but all of these studies are imaging studies, so we have to see, of course, endpoint studies to see how useful this is. If we come to imaging, there are a lot of imaging studies where artificial HDL have been used, and I think what is important to make um, imaging effective in vivo is to improve the targeting, and there are different functionalizations. This is an interesting functionalization where the RHDL particle has been functionalized with a collagen-specific peptide, which leads to the enrichment of this RHDL. Here is its pre-treatment, and this is post 24 hours post-treatment. And they used an interesting mouse model, which is called so-called reversal mouse. This reversal mouse is a hyperlipidemic mouse that develops atherosclerosis, and it has a, has a um, targeted um, trend gene, which causes a knockout of the um, MTP, of the microsomal transfer protein. That means when this plug is, de is already developed, you can interrupt the hyperlipidemia by interrupting the LDL production. And what is, can be visualized here, what has been visualized here, is the regression of the asoscotic plug within 28 hours. As I said, it's not the only functionalization. There are also other functionalization to functionalize it to target it to, to macrophages and also or to prevent liver uptake. And also if it comes to tumor treatment, um, here it's an RGD um, um, mapping or targeting to enrich it in endocele cells that are, um, that are increased in, during tumor growth. And finally, which is more or less a combination of both, a diagnostic approach where um, RHDL have been used that are loaded with statins with simvastatin, and in addition have been loaded with different imaging molecules for MRI imaging or fluorescence um, imaging ex vivo. And what can be seen is that when these RHDL are delivered to an APOE deficient mice that develops atherosclerosis, and I have also to step one step before here, um, one can see here the enrichment of the RHDL particles, and what is even more interesting is that the simvastatin loading of the RHDL is helping to increase the antiosogenicity of this RHDL. What you can see here, when the plug was measured, that the placebo have no effect, then the RHDL without any statin had very modest effects, but the combination of both was most effective in inducing plug regression. So I would like to summarize that HDL are natural multimolecular and multifunctional nanoparticles. You can make them artificially. Artificially reconstituted HDL mimic many biological activities of natural HDL, both in vitro and in vivo. In medicine, our HDL are interesting for therapy. Most of the work has been done on atherosclerosis, but in principle, it would be also be interested for infection, for inflammation, for neurodegeneration. Um, diagnostic imaging um, for atherosclerosis, but there is also some work for cancer. And for targeted drug delivery for atherosclerosis, and again, also for cancer. And it's also interesting because these particles can pass the blood-brain barrier to target um, CNS diseases. So there is a need for gain of knowledge, I think, nevertheless. Um, I think I will address this very shortly. I mean, we need to better understand the metabolism, especially, and that's what Dr. Hunziker already addressed, how these particles are transported through the endothelium. Also, how they are removed. I mean, for the time being, we don't know how HDL, the protein moiety especially, is removed from the circulation. That's very different from LDL, where we know it very well from, by the LDL receptor pathway. I mean, there's a lot of work to improve functionalization, to improve the targeting to organs, but also drugs and labels. Then there's a need to upscale GMP production. And of course, finally, we need clinical studies to prove safety and efficacy of this approach. Um, the big question that already has been addressed by um, Dr. Hunziker is the question, how do lipoteins or nanoparticles enter the vascular, vascular wall to, end, to, to produce atherosclerosis um, and for HDL to prevent atherosclerosis. Do they enter from the vascular side or do they enter from the luminal side? And the other point, if it comes to HDL, especially for drug treatments, they have also to, to leave the arterial wall because we know when HDL is staying in the vascular wall, it gets modified and then it gets more pro and anti-atherogenic, so it has also to, to leave the arterial wall again 
And here we have got some recent evidence that the removal out of the wall is happening via the lymphatics. Um, people believe, if it comes to the question, how do plasma proteins enter um, the extracellular space? Um, how do, do they leave the plasma compartment to enter the extravascular space? You find cartoons of everything. You find people who like to destroy some endothelial cells, and that's leakage through destroyed endothelium. You find um, paracellular transports through open junctions. Um, you find fluid channel, and you find some people who like to draw arrows through the cell. Um, probably both is correct. I mean, there is paracellular transport, but this paracellular transport is not a passive filtration because the, the junctions here are regulated. And one interesting regulator here is sphingosine 1-phosphate. And as I told you, sphingosine 1-phosphate is carried by HDL. That means HDL carries a signal to induce closure of the junctions. And we ourselves, we have got a lot of data indicating that also transcellular transport through the endothelium is happening. And we have brought a lot of in vitro evidence for the moment that these involve several players like the ATP binding cassette transporters, scavenger receptors, and then ectopic beta ATPase, which is producing ligands for P2Y receptors. And to give you some idea that this might be relevant for in vivo, we got a mouse model, or we produced a mouse model together with Dr. Parks from Chapel Hill, uh, from Winston Salem, North Carolina, and which lacks ABCA1 only in the endothelial cells and looked how do the APOE1 or the HDL particle enter the vascular wall in this wild type mouse model versus the ABC1 endothelial knockout model. And what you can see is that the knockout leads to a decreased uptake of the label. You see by trends also for HDL, but if you take other proteins like albumin or um, LDL, you don't see this. So what I believe and what we believe is that and I think this is an important question for nanomedicine, that the transport of HDL from the blood into the vasculature, and that's probably true also for other nanoparticles, is not an unregulated process, but it's a regulated process, and to exploit it, we need a better understanding of this transport. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Eckerstein. This was actually a very, very nice talk of, uh, and, uh, in a short uh, time uh, to show us all these uh, mechanisms and potentials of HDL. I would like to say one thing about, you remember this APOE1 Milano, you, you referred about 2003 publication in JAMA. Uh, but this company, it was a company actually, probably many of you know, mm -hmm. that it was a company, uh, Esperion, that was bought one day before this publication for one billion euros or Pfizer. dollars mm -hmm. from Pfizer. So from that time, we do not know what happened. Yeah. I mean, this APOE1 Milano had a long journey. I mean, as the name said, it was detected in Newton carriers in, 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 the, Lake, in the Lago di Garda area in, 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 in northern Italy. And then it was rather quickly um, patented. And many people say that's the reason why the mutant is used, because you cannot make any patent on normal APOE1, but you can make a patent on such a mutant APOE1. And then it has been developed. I mean, the first company was Pharmacia, then it went to Asperion, then it went to Pfizer. Now it is with a medicines company. And yes, the medicines the company States, is yeah. um, now, I mean, they had to fight some, I mean, there were some adverse events uh, connected with this APOE1 Milano, one inflammatory event that had to be found out what was the reason there was a contamination that was brought into the particles by the industrial fabrication process and now they managed to get rid of it and we are looking forward to the next series of clinical studies now. But do you know what is the status today of this technology? I think they are entering phase two trials again. Okay, it's good. Then uh, questions, yes, Professor Mike. Something known in detail um, about the influence um, of HDL to the polarization of macrophages and to the inflammatory process if they enter the plaque scenario or the, this complex? I mean, to make the, I mean, the simple answer is, I mean, in the plaque, I think that has been not explored. But I mean, in, in vitro, I mean, there are data suggesting that, um, that the cytokine network also is regulated by HDL. 
and um, that's but that's probably not only happening in the differentiated macrophages. There is interesting work from um, Alan Tall's lab that already during a myelopoiesis in the bone marrow, um, cholesterol um, content appears to be a, an important regulator. I mean, if, I mean, there are data around that HDL cholesterol, for example, is inversely correlating with the monocyte number in the blood. And I mean, if you take a knockout of ABCA1, um, where the cholesterol is getting enriched in the, uh, during the myelopoiesis, and the animals um, have higher numbers of, of leukocytes, including monocytes. That means during the whole process from myelopoiesis down, down the way to the macrophage differentiation, there appear, appears that, it, that HDL has some impact, and, but it's by far not well, un, well, under, well investigated. Because this is very thinkable, uh, very pro probable, because also the antioxidative enzymes yeah. of HDA, like the baroxonase, yeah. uh, may nicely act in this scenario. Uh. Mm -hmm. I think what I believe is, I mean, if you ask the question, why did nature invent HDL, certainly not to protect from atherosclerosis. I mean, this is not a rate-limiting step in evolution, this disease. And um, so I think, in, in my view, HDL is part of the innate host defense, very similar to macrophages themselves. So it's, I mean, they, they play an important role in detoxification, and cholesterol is a molecule that needs to be detoxified. There are antimicrob antimicrobial activities connected, and it exerts a lot of um, um, repair mechanisms and to, to repair some damage. But as with monocytes or macrophages, as if the if the aggression goes on, then you, I mean HDL appears to be to, turn, to be turned into a kind of damage associated with molecular pathogen. I mean it becomes more a problem than a solution. So that makes it very difficult to exploit HDL by by by, by raising drugs. But might be if in an acute setting like acute coronary syndrome or an acute infection um, that the, the pro, to provide HDL particles in a very limited period of time could be helpful. Probably the, uh, the time point and the black state will be important, as Professor Hunzik mm. told us about this difference phenotype. Any other question? Yes. Yeah, uh, Professor Scott. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my question is actually uh, limited more to the uh, claimed usefulness of HDL as a targeted drug nanoparticle. And there have been quite some studies nowadays recently appearing. Many years ago, maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, there were also studies. But what is your opinion? If you put a drug in an HDL nanoparticle for targeting to, for instance, plaques, um, is it really uh, doable? Are there any, you study the literature probably intensively, are there any systematic studies in which they compare, let's say, the non-incorporated drug with the HDL-bound drug? Because I would feel if you put drugs in this type of nanoparticles, it's not actually targeting of your drug. Hmm. Maybe the HDL goes in, but the, the, the drug is mostly hydrophobic. That's why it goes in. It's goes, going out in the circulation very rapidly. Hmm. Do you have an opinion on this? Yeah. I mean, I agree with you that there are very scarce data. I mean, this paper here, which has been published very prominently, is probably one of the first ones that really compared a drug incorporated to HDL with the HDL itself and with the drug. I mean, here you see the statin treatment has some effect, but I must say statins don't work nicely in mice. So it might be, I mean, they took here a mouse model and statins, I mean, I mean not if, very if statins have been developed in mice, probably nobody had con left this development phase into a clinical phase. I mean, it would have died in the preclinical phase because mice don't react very nicely to statins. So here you see something, um, and you see some more if you combine it with the HDL. But I agree with you that there is... Um, not much of these systematic studies that you are indicating where one has really to compare the drug effect with the combined drug RHDL effect. Thank you. Actually, I would like to say one comment finally, that uh, as you understand that this disease is more complex than cancer, because in cancer 
you can kill, let's say, as much cells as you like, and then this is even better. But in our case, if you are very aggressive in, in trying to treat the plaques, you can easily damage healthy endothelium, uh, neighboring endothelium, or destabilize the infrastructure of the plaque and then co uh, kill your patient instead of curing him so, or, or her. So it's more complex setup rather, rather than cancer. That's why, till today, despite that we say we have statins, we have balloon angioplasty surgery, uh, still we have 17.5 million deaths from cardiovascular diseases and all cancer types together, 200 types, 8.2 million deaths per year. Okay, I would like to thank the speakers, first of all, for the very interesting talks and also that, uh, that it was uh, perfectly on time, so we are now uh, exactly on time for a break. Thank you very much, all.